I'm Ken Feith the Metro Archives. I want to thank you all for being here today for our first Tuesday. Uh, if you're viewing, thank you for viewing. Uh, today we have a special guest, Elizabeth Taylor, and she's going to be talking about Camp Forest down in Tullahoma. And I think this is a this is a great day to have it. This is June 6th. This is D-Day. So this is the day that in 1944 the Allies invaded the Normandy coast. And so a lot of that preparation was done in Camp Forest. And She's going to get into a lot more of this than, than I will, but I'm a World War II buff, so that camp down there, a lot of people down there, uh, a lot of German, some Italian POWs. I don't think people realize how much Tennessee was involved in World War II because of our terrain and several other things. So let me introduce our speaker, or I'll get off on a soapbox and you'll know. Okay. Uh, camp Forest was a training, induction, and combat facility. Um, located outside Tullahoma, Tennessee. Uh, it had 70,000 70, soldiers and 12,000 civilians were employed there. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor has a doctorate in public administration. She's researched many aspects of Camp Forest and the home front. And she currently maintains a Camp Forest uh, website and welcomes individuals to comment and add photographs especially. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much, and thanks so much for uh, attending today. Um, as I had uh, said to a couple of people that got here um, before we started, um, my area of expertise is not military history or really history in general. It's um, public administration, how uh, systems work. But in talking with a professor one day about um, POWs that were housed in the U.S., I was just flabbergasted because I had never heard such a thing. It's not something, at least during my um, middle school, high school years, that we learned. Uh, so I started uh, researching Camp Forest. He was from the Tennessee area, so he kind of got me on that lead. And there was not a lot of information out there um, on it, little beats, be, bits and pieces here and there. Uh, and so one of the things is I did the Images America Camp Forest book and found just uh, loads of, of photographs that I thought would bring the story of Camp Forest back to life because Camp Forest doesn't exist anymore. Right after the war, it was completely dismantled and whole cloth um, bits and pieces hauled away uh, throughout Tennessee. You know, people will tell you that, oh, my parents built this house out of wood from Camp Forest, or oh, our floor is from Camp Forest. So there's bits and pieces here and there, but on the site in general, um, all that exists are a few chimneys and a few um, concrete foundations. And what I'll do today is just kind of give you an overview of what Camp Forest is and, and um, the Tullahoma area. And, and if you have questions or comments, I, I'd love to hear it. Um, this um, lady here said her parents met at Camp Forest, and he said uh, his brother was there uh, visiting one time at Camp Forest. Um, these are especially stories are especially important to me because I'm trying to do a second book um, called Voices of Camp Forest, where we can um, learn perspectives of people who were there, whether they were children or soldiers or um, POWs. So. Um, Camp Forest actually started as Camp P. Um, one of the things that was unique about it, Tennessee was one of the first states to have its own National Guard. Many of the National Guards that were housed um, in the states were National Guards. So Tullahoma, in an effort to um, help bolster its economy, tried at first to get a um, federal uh, facility and was not successful, so they built their own uh, state facility. And it's on these grounds, and, and this was a, a big facility in and of itself. It's kind of hard to see with this aerial photo, but uh, let's see. It was about a thousand acres and uh, on average had about 2,500 men that would do maneuvers throughout the year. Um, it also housed flood victims and was an FBI training facility when it wasn't um, used for, tr uh, for military training. And this is an old photograph that I was able to get of the 
National Guard unit. Unfortunately, I don't know the names of the people uh, here because it was a handed down photograph. But um, these were some of the men that trained there. Uh, the facility had stables because at that time we still had horse uh, infantry. Um, as World War II started, one of the um, people who was very um, key in bringing the military facility to Tennessee was Governor Prentice, as well as a couple of senators and uh, town leaders in Tullahoma. And one of the things that they used as leverage to get this facility in Tennessee was the fact that they already had Camp P. And so at the onset of World War II, the government appropriated and expanded it into uh, an army training and induction base. And they used it to train, gosh, uh, hundreds of thousands, as we said, men and um, for going overseas. Uh, individuals came throughout the Southeast to help build the facility. Uh, it expanded from that 1,000 acres to 85,000 acres. So it had barracks, it had um, mess kitchens, it had its own railroad spur, um, over 1,300 buildings and about 36 million to, um, to build. And I don't know if you can calculate that to what today's monies would be, but that's 36 million in the 19... Third, uh, late 30s, 40s. And this is one of the early photographs of Camp Forest. And one of the ways um, that they uh, appropriated land for Camp Forest, some sold land, some of it was taken by eminent domain. I've talked with a lot of people who remember that their uh, grandparents' farmland was taken to uh, build camp forest, if you will. Um, it was renamed from Camp P to Camp Forest um, in honor of Nathan Bedford Forest, which was upsetting for a lot of individuals, um, given Nathan Bedford Forest um, Civil War exploits and affiliation with the, the KKK. But that eventually died down and individuals focused more on the war effort and training individuals. Now Camp Forest had its own parade ground which was large enough to have air um, planes land. But there was also William Northern Field which was used to train the um, Air Force. Which from what I understand, if someone knows differently, emerged from uh, the Army. Um, it was truly a self-sustaining city. Um, it had training grounds for infantry, artillery, engineering, signal divisions, uh, chemical warfare. Um, there was numerous battalions that, uh, you know, left there headed for the European battlefronts. Uh, there were over 81 different battalions that served at Camp Forest at various points throughout the war. And, um, of note, especially for today, uh, there were a number of ranger divisions that served at Camp Forest, and many of those were individuals who stormed the beaches at Normandy. And one of the things that was said, or at least I've read, is that um, those men were able to scale the cliffs at record speed due to the training that they received at Camp Forest because they scaled a lot of the cliffs that were in Middle Tennessee. One of the benefits to having Camp Forest is because the government felt that the area just most closely resembled that of the uh, European front that they were sending men to. And then I don't know if many of you remember the war games that went through, not that you were there, but um, that occurred. You may have heard of that. Um, Patton came to Camp Forest as well uh, and had training. Uh, a lot of people tell me how they remember the soldiers marching through and on maneuvers, just general maneuvers and practice. So one of the things, and 
There was also paratrooper training, glider training. As far as, and, and one of the things I told one of the other individuals, they did um, use live ordinances. And so there is still to this day, you have to be careful in some of the areas because there are still unexploded ordinances that are out there. Um, they had a Spencer Artillery Field where they practiced on a whole host of um, machine guns, uh, uh, large uh, guns, uh, shells. Um, in practicing for um, taking off with the airfields and bombing, since it was a residential area, they obviously couldn't drop live shells, they dropped big flower sacks. And so individuals would see, and they would know that they hit their target by the big flower plumes that were there. Uh, so there's just a, a whole host of, of wonderful little stories like that that people have told me. Um, it was definitely the first of its kind and definitely had modern facility of the time. It had its own hospital what we would, I think, think of as emergent care outpatient facility, pharmacy. Um, they did operations. Uh, a number of people had their children there. A lot of people have um, on their birth certificate, the city is listed as Camp Forest because Camp Forest was considered the fifth largest city in Tennessee at the time. One of the other unique aspects of Camp Forest and one of the things that we think of is just uh, commonplace today is it had one of the first mock German villages. So soldiers got the feel of clearing and going into a village in Germany by actually constructing one. And they would learn how to um, arm and disarm um, fire uh, bombs and stuff in, in those. Um, they have said that there were bombs like if you moved a broom, it would go off because it was a trigger. Small canteens, candy bars, bottles of liquor, anything that would be enticing for somebody to pick up would be a potential bomb that would explode. Um, the staff of the hospital was the 300th General Hospital. So those individuals got training before going to the front as well. Um, you see photographs and you hear stories of some of the nurses. They actually had to go through basic training as well to be able to carry large loads because you never know where you were going to be dropped in and what you would have to carry and do. So everybody got training, no matter who you were or what your position was. Um, with the construction, about 22 to 28,000 individuals flooded in from the southern uh, area to help build Camp Forest. So it went from a sleepy little Tennessee town to a real booming uh, facility. And then from there, it even blossomed more with all of the people that worked at Camp Forest as well as the troops that came in. Um, as I mentioned, it took 36 million to build. There were over 1,300 buildings, 55 miles of roads, its own railroad track, um, guard houses, warehouses, mess buildings, you name it, Camp Forest had it. Um, a lot of the local farmers benefited from Camp Forest because they sold their products, whether it was fruits and vegetables or milk, to Camp Forest. So, it was an asset, most certainly, to the entire area. These are just some of the pictures um, of Tullahoma itself. They said that usually on Saturdays during the height of the war, um, most residents didn't go to town because it was shoulder to shoulder full of soldiers. Um, they started out with the Strand Theater, but then to accommodate the overflow, they built two more. Um, lots of businesses sprang up. Um, the lady whose father owned the local furniture store said that he had to travel, you know, out to the Midwest to get furniture because soldiers would come in and buy a hope chest and send it home. And so having even, you know, furniture 
for people to buy was um, a struggle. Um, having, you know, cafes and stuff like that because people didn't go out to eat in the same fashion that we do today. So accommodating that. Um, in Tullahoma, one of the um, things, it, it had lots of um, businesses as far as it had the baseball um, company that made the baseballs, bedspreads. Um, a lot of industry was already there, so it, it was a lot of influx. Everyone, from what I can read in newspapers of the day and stories I've heard, everyone opened their home to soldiers, to um, people that came down from the north to be with their loved ones. Um, this kind of shows you a perspective of where it is. Um, and Nathan Bedford Forest, um, for what it was named for. And these are just some of the, the pictures that I found on Camp Forest. Um, and you can just see the enormity of it. Troops marching, field training. Um, these are actually barbed wire that men are um, walking through, which from what I've read of the accounts of D-Day, those beaches were filled with shrapnel, with anything that they could to prevent people from advancing forward. So this training was pivotal um, to them. Men learning how to do dirty fighting, which I found very interesting because you had to train people to fight in what at the time I assume, I guess, is unconventional ways that there were no rules. You took every advantage that you could because it was either you or that enemy. And as I mentioned, this is some of the cliff climbing um, practice that they had. And there are uh, a lot more photographs in the book of the training where the goal was to put them in a situation so that when they got over there, when it was real, when it was go time, there was, wasn't an opportunity for them to seize up, to be feared. Um, they got in, they got the job done type of thing. This is the mock German village. A um, lot of um, little pictures of Hitler, German writing. It made it as realistic as possible. Other bases in the Midwest mocked Japanese villages. So this was really um, high tech for the time. And I think something that most modern military does today. Mail call. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of letters out there. And I've had the opportunity to read a lot of letters that people sent home. And for me, it's quite eye-opening because what we would think as a phone call for five minutes at night, they didn't have that. You couldn't just go make a phone call to say hello to your loved one. You wrote a letter, and some of the letters were even, you know, not even an hour away, their loved one, but they wrote every day. And in an effort to keep those spirits high, mail service um, or postage, any letters going to and from soldiers were free. So uh, people wrote every day and just of the most mundane stuff telling how their day was. But for them, that keeping that connection, having that reason for being there, the reason for fighting, um, kept spirits high. Camp Forest um, also had a lot of recreational uh, areas as well. This is a day room, a reading room. Um, it also had a sports arena. It had theaters on base, uh, golf course, swimming area. Uh, the the um, soldiers would spend the day training, but then they'd have that downtime, or they'd have time uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, just depending. This is a playbill 
They had a theater group, um, an orchestra as well, uh, a library. One of the things that you hear or I, that I've read is that they took hygiene very seriously. You would think in war, in training, shaving, who cares? But I read in letters a lot, no, nope, I gotta go. I gotta go shave and get ready for bed. Um, keeping oneself clean, uh, doing laundry. Um, they had uh, laundry uh, bags, lister bags that they would create, and those were showers that they had. So, um, you know, laundry out in the field was uh, important. Uh, food sourced by local farmers, like I said. Um, some of the stories recount that the exploding ordinances and gunfire caused milk to sour, chickens to not lay eggs, so uh, the damages to local farms were uh, enormous. So they uh, put in requests to the government to have um, fields repaired, fences repaired, because when they were having their war games, you know, being courteous to someone's land, they weren't going to be courteous, you know, when they were overseas, so they just plowed through and mowed over. But the government, from what I understand, paid up for everything. <laughs> so um, not something I think that we would see nowadays, but different time. Camp Forest eventually transitioned to a POW facility. And this is what started me on my journey to, to learn more about it. Um, for a small window of time, it was a, um, it did house civilian um, internees, but those were eventually shipped off uh, to the Midwest and out West and it housed German soldiers and Italian mainly. I have not heard or read stories as of yet that these individuals um, had any problem with being here. From what I understand, they were glad to be here and certainly when the time came did not want to go home. They were used to help um, bring in farms, uh, uh, cotton, wheat, fruits, um, and they were paid 80 cents a day and uh, eventually had their check cut when they went back home. But these individuals made lasting relationships with a lot of the farmers. And um, they talk about how, you know, they had the language barrier, but they managed to communicate um, I, I was telling this gentleman earlier that um, there was a family who had a number of POWs that worked on their farm and those individuals would write them. Not many people at the time knew German, so the individual would send the letter to the family. The family would then send that letter to a professor they knew in Kentucky, had it translated, had it sent back. They would write their letter send it to have it translated in German and then sent home. So even to that degree of trying to communicate, trying to keep up with these people lasted after the war. Um, many people talked about how they would send them clothes, food, rations, just because the country was devastated. Um, even as a POW facility, they had, um, an orchestra, uh, sports teams, they did their own newsletter. Um, so it, and from what I understand, um, there was a number of times that the guards got in trouble because they didn't really guard them. Nobody really wanted to leave. So, you know, everybody just kind of uh, stayed. There were some instances where a couple escaped but they were so tired, they eventually returned. They just said it was too much work to try to escape. Um, 
there was one individual that's reported as being shot and killed and the stories differ that the guard that shot him was new and it was an accident so I don't know but um, most of the individuals died of natural causes um, because they were happy to be there. Uh, one gentleman delivered milk there and he developed a friendship with one of the young men that helped uh, float it and he would bring him a little special bottle of chocolate milk every day. So he said we couldn't talk but I knew he was always happy and he was always nice and helped me unload everything. Um, after the war, Camp Forest was decommissioned. The federal government felt it was too expensive to maintain it, that it was sold as surplus. There were auctions for months on uh, end after that, everything from soup ladles to electrical wiring to the manhole covers, literally lock, stock, and barrel sold. Uh, individuals talk about how um, they'll have uh, a house made from the lumber at Camp Forest. Every building, the lumber was um, torn down and reused. There are some buildings that were taken whole cloth and um, put on new sites. Um, one of the chapels, I think there were about 12 chapels at Camp Forest. Um, there's one in McMinnville that's still used as a little church today. The sports arena is now used by one of the um, colleges as their facility. So there are still pieces of it around, but um, you have to really look to see it. What um, they did with the property after that is Truman developed um, or commissioned uh, Arnold Engineering Facility. Um, it's a big Air Force and civilian complex where they test jet engines, propulsion, things like that. So that original 88,000 acres was lapsed into, oh gosh, I can't even remember, but that is now just one small aspect of the entire AEDC complex. Uh, and it was named after Henry Arnold, which is my understanding he was one of the first Air Force colonels and was pivotal in getting the Air Force um, up and going. And um, people have vivid memories of Camp Forest, more than I would have ever remembered or thought anybody would have remembered. I mean, it was decommissioned and torn down so long ago. So, um, does anybody have any questions or stories or comments? General World War II remembrances? <laughs> Elizabeth, it sounds like uh, the, um, when the camp came in, it made a huge impact to the community down there as far as the farms and the businesses and especially town, you know. So I'm just curious, after the war, um, you know, Arnold Engineering came in, but was there, did the, did the town or the surrounding rural community, did it suffer much from all of that going away as far as the help? And from what I understand from the individuals, it suffered greatly. It was a bust. Um, the economy went uh, pretty much tanked. You don't see a lot of that in the newspapers. There's not a lot of that reported. And so um, in asking, everybody's like, oh gosh, it was a ghost town. So, I mean, once it left, it was gone. Um, it slowly rebuilt, and there's a, a lot to it now, but at the time, no, it was hor horrific. So. Can you tell us a little bit about the, um, how you did your research, like where you went to find the stories or the photographs that you used for your book? Most of the photographs um, were obtained from the National Archives. Um, I had a researcher um, go and, and, and make copies of those, unfortunately, because I haven't been able to go myself. Um, one of the things, the Camp Forest website, campforest.com, has been up for um, many years, and the gentleman 
was getting old and he sold it to me. And so he had done a lot of research, a lot of individuals with connections to Camp Forest, um, either family or, or um, personal connections. And so I just started combing through that and family members opened up and shared photographs that they had, um, stories that they've had. Um, after the first book was released, um, I got a lot of news uh, coverage on it and people, you know, I remember when and just stories from there. And so a lot of the stories I have now are a result of that. But the bulk of it was from the National Archives. So if you know anybody or have any stories, I'd love to hear them. Um, for me, even knowing what to some is a mundane detail is not because a lot of stuff is lost in history if we don't write it down. Even the fact, you know, when I talk with, with some of the ladies and, and they talk about being a child, they talk about living in houses that didn't have electricity and I'm like, gosh, that's not that long ago. How could you not have electricity? And it was just of the time. They talk about their mom making dresses out of the big flower sacks. And so, you know, having that true to life reality are things that I want to document and record. Um, the fact that you didn't go out to eat, that you cooked at home, that you had those big family meals like you see on TV, that that, that is the way life was. You did mention that um, there were a, a few people that died while they were there. Mm -hmm. um, were they buried there? Were they sent home? Especially with POWs, um, is there any kind of cemetery down there now? Or? There is, and uh, one of the interesting facts, um, Davis Cuthbert Funeral Home, which is still in existence today, had the Army contract for processing um, the deceased when it was an Army facility and when it was a POW facility. Generally, for those that were, when it was an Army installation, the funeral home prepared them and shipped them home. And there are detailed records to that effect. Uh, to that effect. Um, in researching those, uh, someone had said something to me about a murder. And I'm like, she thought that it was a story her mother had made up to make her want to stay at home and not wander around town and get lost. But um, in fact, there was a young lady from Iowa that was murdered and stuff like that is, is in those records. Uh, the POWs were processed in the same fashion and um, were buried in a cemetery and after the war, they were um, moved to another facility, uh, for, to another one, but they are still there. Uh, cemeteries are there and documented. You had a question? Yes, I just wanted to say, it seems to be a recurring theme, you know, what little I've read or seen in published print, what have you, about the uh, German prisoners at these camps becoming familiar with the surrounding town people and you know really uh, getting down to a human <laughs> basic nature with them. Uh, I know my father had told me he was at a similar kind of camp in Hallisville, Alabama uh, for captured soldiers and he told me about how they at first you know they come and they hoard soap and they they would hoard bread and stuff like that and then after a while they learned that you know there was plenty to be had uh, a similar thing about uh, the American GIs would take them out on the work detail and the GIs would fall asleep under a tree <laughs> while they worked and then they'd come over and point to a wake, wake them up, point to the watch saying it's time to go eat or what have you, uh, and that kind of thing. And on the other note, you mentioned about there being uh, Italian, uh, uh, people, Italian Americans that were in. Uh, kept there, like in some of these Japanese internment camps? No, they were actually Italian soldiers. Um, I cannot find a lot on it. There's snippets of it, but as far as letters home, anything like that, I haven't, haven't I don't have anything documented. Um, there's more out there about German POWs than, than other, um, which from what I heard, just given the animosity between the two countries, 
you would think there would have been more recorded problems than there were, um, but I've not found anything yet. So um, has the town built any kind of his historical uh, venue or anything to commemorate? Um, there is. There is a small museum that um, has a, a few relics, um, and then there's a few things. Um, at the Fine Arts Center has some uh, POW artwork, um, but nothing major as of yet. There is going to be, I believe in McMinnville, Mont Eagle, a POW, I mean a, a World War II museum. Um, one of the things that it's going to have is a lot of um, tanks and military vehicles and stuff like that, but it's, it's going to be a wonderful facility and they're going to have a small camp forest section as well. I know that uh, this town in Alabama, Aliceville, evidently it had a large commemoration of the, by the time I graduated from high school, my father took us on a trip and wanted to see what was left of the camp and everything. We finally found the place and it was all overgrown and there was just one or two old shacks and that was all that was left of it at that time. And, Everything, but I found online out of curiosity several years ago just to see you know what was out there. They evidently had resurrected a lot of information about what took place there and everything. They had several days where they held festivals. Some of the German prisoners wound up, you know, in a, immigrating to the U.S. and living there. Uh, some of them came back to visit, you know, that type of thing. They do have a, um, a large memorial at one of the main gates, and that main road is still there. Um, they did have, probably about 15 years ago, a big uh, commemoration celebration. A lot of POWs did come back, um, people that were there, but I don't know of anything since then. Um, I've seen a good bit of artwork, a good bit of um, carvings and stuff like that. They're just, they're just beautiful. Um, yes, sir. In your research as a government specialist, did you, have you looked at the political environment and what happened at the beginning and the end, or beginning of the war and how the dynamics will be? I haven't, but there are so many aspects of Camp Forest that I want to, um, research and do more that the economy the POWs that there's just so many or aspects my my parent my father was involved in in a lot of the war effort and he talked about uh, building a steel mill in the west hmm? and the land that they selected for the steel mill happened to be what are called stake farms for the LDS church. The LDS church is divided into districts and each stake had a farm. And the land that was selected for the steel mill was on the land. And they had a board house near there and the government had appropriated the land and they had a meeting for the stake presidents. The stake presidents came and said, we would like to harvest our land, our prop crops before you build a steel mill. And they said, um, they better be out of here by next week or else. Huh. And that was the, once where war was declared, there were no civil rights. None, yes. And I suspect that's what went on there. I think more than I've probably found, um, I've heard a lot of stories of, of eminent domain, and there are a few records that I found at the National Archives in Atlanta that attest to that um, because people were writing to the government. And then, unfortunately, the government promised to return that land. If you loan it to us, we'll give it back. It didn't happen. Didn't loan. Uh, yeah, there's no such thing as a government loan. Uh, so. So Arnold, the um, Arnold Engineering is there, mm -hmm. and then part of it is a um, National Guard training camp. Is is um, what's there now? Is that the original footprint of Camp Forest, or did it shrink? Has it gotten the, the, the what, um, what, what they're using now? Is that the old Camp Forest, the boundaries of old Camp Forest? Yes, the um, old Camp Forest is just a small piece of the now AEDC footprint. 
Um, it, it dwarfs the, the camp forest. Mm -hmm. um, I've had uh, individuals who go deer hunting out there. Um, they say that they just routinely let them go out there, but um, they talk about, you know, finding little relics here and there. Um, I've heard stories where you have to be careful because they took all the manhole covers, so all of the sewage system is open. So you do have the possibility of falling down a well, so to speak. Um, they say there's not much else out there. Um, one, I had heard and read that they were doing some archaeological surveys um, out there of what was the segregated section of Camp Forest. Um, Camp Forest had two battalions of African-American soldiers out there. And um, a lot of those, I, I've not actually gotten to, to speak with um, any survivors that were there. I know of one or two in Atlanta, but from what I've read, they were, as of the time, uh, subjected to the segregation of the South. So um, they didn't have a lot and so I think that's why they were doing the ex excavation to see if there was anything left out there. So the, after the war, the, the, um, the government didn't do a lot of remediation as far as damage to the <laughs> Zero. area or the manhole covers and all that stuff. And, uh -uh. You know, well, it's your problem now. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They are uh, responsible or, or seem to be responsible for when they come, um, come across the unexploded ordinances. Um, some of the um, more heavily used areas like a Spencer Artillery Field, which I think was about 30 miles or so out from the Camp Forest proper, um, they did a lot of cleanup out there. But I, I've heard people, you can find shells and all kind of stuff out there. So, interesting piece of history. Well, thank you all so much. I, I I appreciate your time and um, hope I provided you a little more information. And uh, if you have questions, I'm, I'm always happy to, to talk about Camp Forest and learn more about it myself. <laughs>